Okay. We might make a start now. Um, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming in nice and early. I know we all lost an hour of sleep last night as well. That was a bit, uh, a bit harsh. I was saying to uh, uh, Dr. Goy Tazillo, who I'll introduce in just a moment, who's come from the uh, United States, he's lost an hour of sleep last night. And to get it back, the only way he can do that is by coming back to Australia at another time in March, April. So um, he's going to have to make a return trip. Um, just before we get started on our uh, updates in regional anaesthesia session this morning, um, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention a couple of housekeeping things. Um, so uh, firstly, for every, anybody who was at the gala dinner last night, congratulations on uh, turning up to the session this morning. Um, I was there as well. It was a fantastic evening, a beautiful venue and uh, uh, some nice band and music and food and drink. It was a, a great night had by all. Um, Secondly, any, if there's any changes to the program, they'll be displayed on the screens next to the registration uh, desk and will appear on the electronic screen inside the exhibition hall as well. So uh, please reference the app if, uh, if all of you have downloaded the app, or if not, you feel free to download it. Um, for the most up-to-date program, that'll be on the app as well throughout the Congress. Um, if you have tickets to a social function and can no longer attend, if you just advise the Congress organiser at the registration desk and they can take care of that for you as well. Um, also, should you wish to attend any of the small group discussions, masterclass or workshop um, that you may not be registered for already, um, there is a list of available sessions um, and that, that will be available from morning tea. So um, if you haven't signed up already, it's not, not always lost, you haven't missed out, you can always go and have a look and see if there's any availability and sign up for them later on. Um, one, including one such session which might be the uh, regional block sessions that uh, our guests will be uh, demonstrating at this afternoon. Um, one last thing, if you wouldn't mind just turning your mobile phones to silent for the duration of the talks, um, that would be fantastic. So the housekeeping's out of the way, so without further ado, I would uh, like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr Enrique Goitizolo. Dr Goitizolo. Uh, he's graduated from the Regional Anesthesia Fellowship Program at the Hospital for Special Surgery uh, in uh, Manhattan, New York City in 1998. Following completion of his fellowship, Dr. Goitizolo spent six years at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, where he helped to develop a Regional Anesthesia Program. In 2004, Dr. Goitizolo was recruited back to uh, Hospital for Special Surgery. Dr. Goitizolo's main interest is the impact of anesthesia on rehabilitation for orthopaedic surgery. He's a member of the department's education committee and is involved in coordinating and establishing guidelines for the regional anesthesia fellows and rotating residents, uh, among many other academic activities that he, he conducts at HSS. Dr. Goitazolo also oversees the department's academic observership program, where in fact is actually where we met a few years ago, uh, a program in which anesthesiologists from all over the world come to HSS to observe uh, the advanced regional anaesthetic techniques that they employ there on a daily basis in very high volume. Dr. Goitazolo has given presentations at numerous international meetings and programs and lectured on a variety of regional anaesthesia topics and we're very lucky to have him here all the way from uh, New York City this morning to talk about some of the experiences uh, from working in a busy private hospital in Manhattan and applying regional anaesthesia in, in uh, high volume, uh, high efficiency and with high patient satisfaction. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Gortizillo to the podium. Alistair, thanks very much for this great introduction. It is actually a pleasure and an honor to be here. I came all the way from New York City to this beautiful Adelaide. And the first thing that I actually realized here is how different the pace is in Australia. We are used to the high level pace in New York City. Everything runs so fast, and here just I had to just slow down, which is so nice. It's going to be very hard for me to come back to New York City to the same pace. Uh, thank you very much, Alastair, for the invitation to this uh, uh, meeting. Thanks for the organization committee. Uh, it's a really a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be talking today um, about, um, sorry, I have to go back here. What happened to the, how can I go back? There we go. I'm gonna be talking about the experience of regional anesthesia at my hospital. The, this hospital is unique in the sense that 
uh, we do only orthopedics. There's nothing else but orthopedics. It is a pretty busy, open, busy hospital. We have 45 uh, operating rooms, about 30,000 surgeries last year, and only orthopedics, nothing else. And the majority of the, of the uh, surgeries are being done under regional. Um, the last time that I put a tube in a patient, I think, was a couple months ago. So every day, just basically only regional anesthesia. And the regional is done for the surgery. So in the next 45 minutes, I will give you what we do there. Um, I divide the talk, um, a little bit of history of the hospital. Uh, we do peripheral nerve blocks. I'm going to mention some of them. Obviously, I cannot talk all about all of them. What do we do in the busiest uh, surgeries? Total knee arthroplasty, total hip arthroplasty, and total shoulder. The hospital is officially the oldest orthopedic hospital in the USA. It was founded in 1863 in the house of one of the uh, physicians back then, no surgeons. Uh, he started taking care of the, as the name, you see the name, the hospital for the ruptured and crippled. It's a funny name for a hospital, right? but actually it was quite successful. He started taking care of the patient that has some deformities and he got some money, and he moved from his house to another house, and finally he built this hospital. If you have been in New York City, the hospital is, was located where uh, Grand Central Station is, in 42nd Street and Park Avenue. Uh, obviously, it had to be turned down because of the, of the new um, uh, railway station. And slowly moved to different locations. So in the beginning, it was only, uh, obviously, no surgery back then. The, um, the infection rates were very high. So he was taking care of the kids with polio. It was a polio epidemia in, in the USA back then. And he was taking care of the patient with the scoliosis. And he did a lot of casts, a lot of braids. Uh, the patient used to stay here for years. They didn't go, they leave the hospital in one week. Years, they actually live in the hospital. And he was actually quite successful. Uh, in the 1900s, the hospital started moving for the surgery. Uh, another uh, a CEO came in in the 1900s and surgery started. Obviously, surgery back then was only ether, general anesthesia. And carry on throughout the 1900s until 1986, in which a new anesthesiologist came in, Dr. Nigel Sharrock, actually from New Zealand. And he was the one that actually changed the uh, philosophy of the hospital in terms of anesthesia. He went from general anesthesia to regional anesthesia. And he was very uh, vibrant, very enthusiastic. He still is. He's, he was my professor, he was my mentor, and he is now my colleague and friend. And he still works there. He doesn't want to retire. He said he's going to drop dead in the operating room, but he would continue to work until the end. And he changed everything in the hospital. Uh, he brought the regional anesthesia, and I remember when I was a fellow and a resident there, uh, if you do general, it was a failure. So you had to do regional for every single patient for the surgery and for the analgesia afterwards. Uh, so back then, we started with doing only landmark techniques. We didn't have the ultrasound, we didn't have nervous stimulator, and they didn't have just only the landmarks. So the interscaling block was paresthesia technique, the axillary block was transarterial, and the anchor block was only basically the landmarks. In the uh, early 90s, the, the, as you all know, the nervous stimulator came in, and with that, more blocks and more blocks. Little by little, we bump it up the number of blocks that we do in the hospital. I, I started my an anesthesia residency and fellowship around in the mid 90s, 1994, 1995. Until 2004. 2004, the ultrasound came in, and this really changed the whole practice of regional anesthesia. Just to tell you that I finished my my training, um, and I applied for uh, be specialized in regional anesthesia back in the 90s. Um, we had positions in the hospital, and I made my application, and they told me, congratulations, you got the position. Uh, you got you know, the first place in the, in the ranking. And uh, the reason why I got the first place is because I was the only applicant, was no one that applied for this uh, uh, positions back then. Today we have uh, 50 applicants every year for regional anesthesia program. Uh, we have nine fellows every year. 
and they all come from a, you know, Harvard, Mayo Clinic, UCSF, and things like that. And that's because ultrasound. Ultrasound changed completely the way that regional anesthesia was performed in, this country, in the USA. So we have like uh, 25 machines in the hospital, in the three floors that we have, and uh, we basically do all the box and the ultrasound. So today in 2018, what do we do there? Again, upper extremity blocks is all interscaling, as all we know, but important to say is that we only do the breakup plexus block for the surgery. So all the scopes, shoulder scopes, rotator cuff, all the big uh, operations in the shoulder, total shoulder replacements are only done under regional. And we have been moving low, less, I will explain that to you later, we're changing a little bit the way that we do the abdominal plexus. The lower extremity, the majority of the patients, we have a combined spinal epidural, a spinal or an epidural, and then we perform the blocks for the analgesia afterwards. And we pretty much do all the blocks that requires for orthopedics. Some blocks are more popular than others, and uh, <clears throat> some blocks are performed more often than others. So I will describe some of the blocks that we do um, very briefly without entering too, much, too many details. This is the first block. Probably you have not heard about it. Has anybody heard about this block? All right. Very good. Um, it's the new sexy block in town. We, uh, it came to HSS about two years ago. And I have to say that was for it actually very successful because actually provides a good analgesia in the posterior aspect of the, of the knee and the surgeons are in love with it. So <clears throat> if you have a surgeon with you, there's no problem. They're gonna do the block. You're gonna be able to do the block. So uh, what it is is basically you're infiltrating the posterior capsule of the knee. <clears throat> I will show you some videos later on <clears throat> about that. Give <clears throat> and give analgesia for the posterior capsule of the knee, which for the surgeons is a big problem to have the patient on, with the knee extended. Extension of the knee is a big problem, and the surgeons know that. Uh, having a, a contraction after a total knee replacement is not good for the patients and not good for the surgeons. So having this block, giving analgesia for the posterior aspect of the knee, allow the patients to extend the knee and avoid that complication. <clears throat> Sorry. So, the way that is performed, this is actually a uh, picture and a video that I took last week before I came here. Uh, it was on Monday last week. Uh, the position of the patient, as you see the knee, is, uh, is bent, a little bit in the frog position. Um, you put the ultrasound probe under the knee. You, sh you can use the linear probe, you can use the curvilinear probe. And um, the idea, this is actually the video that I, I, I this is a real time. I did not edit the video at all. This, the, the time is actually real. So you can see there, uh, I'm just positioning myself. You can see there the, the, the popliteal artery uh, and the femur. You have to put the femur, um, adjust the probe for the femur to be flat. So you can, I wanna, you're gonna see the needle and the needle has to be parallel to the femur. Important to know is that you don't wanna, you don't wanna get the nerve. Sorry. You wanna get the nerve is right here. There we go. Sorry, sorry guys. Can you play the video again? Is that possible? There we go. So the, the artery is is in view, and the nerve is up here. It's working. The nerve is up here. You can see the nerve a little bit better in a little bit when I position myself. There we go. Nerve is going to be up here. So you don't want to get the nerve because if you do that, the nerve, you're going to have a foot drop. Uh, that's the, this is the tibial component right here. The tibial component of the sciatic nerve. It's very important, like any ultrasound guidance technique, you, not, you need to see the tip of the needle. The tip of the needle has to be very clear so you know exactly where you are delivering the local anesthetic. Um, so I'm, I'm just positioning myself, finding the needle. I take my time to find the needle. The needle is right there. The tip is very clear. And you can advance the needle and uh, as you advance, deliver the local anesthetic. It's a field block, 
So the, local, the, the area is going to fill with local anesthetic, and you're going to get all the, the analgesia you desire. Local, that's the local anesthetic being filled, and that's it. Was, this video took a minute. So one minute since I put the probe into the back of the, the knee until I finished the last uh, local anesthetic. The next block is the ductal canal. The ductal canal is also a very popular block. <coughs> it started about eight years ago at HSS, and it's going to provide analgesia for the anterior and the middle aspect of the knee. Um, the main uh, advantage of this block is there is no motor weakness, so the patients actually can walk. Uh, obviously, indications are main indications in knee surgery, and we combine this block with the adduct with the IPAC. So. Now, basically, all our total knee replacements do a doctor canal and eye pack for analgesia afterwards. <clears throat> this, again, is uh, the same. I was, it was a Monday that I did all these videos. Uh, I had a helper that was helping with the, with the pictures. So this is a real time. You see the knee. It's right here. The knee is right here, and the hip is right there. This is medial, and the other side is lateral. So I don't use the tubing. I don't know if you have any experience with regional. I don't use the tubing for injection. I go directly with the needle. Makes it easy for me. I don't depend on anybody to uh, push the local anesthetic. So I do it myself, uh, and it's quicker. There's no question that it's quicker. So <clears throat> this, again, this is a video that was not edited. You see here the sartorius muscle very, very clearly on the top. This is the femoral artery, and this is going to be the vastus medialis. So we are coming from anterior to posterior. Uh, again, always take your time to see the tip of the needle. The needle is going to be next to the artery, so it's very important to see the tip of the needle. Uh, the needle goes about 2 o'clock. If you think about a, a artery being a, a, a clock, it's about 2 o'clock, and you inject the local anesthetic. You don't see the nerve most of the time. While you are injecting, the nerve is going to appear. The, what nerve is that? The saphenous nerve. And again, this block, what it does is not only block one nerve, but block a series of nerves that goes into the anterior and the middle aspect of the knee. You see the local anesthetics being delivered, and the nerve actually appear. Right here. This white structure is the saphenous nerve with the local anesthetic around it. It's a very easy block to do. And again, the time is one minute. Uh, you have to have the surgeons on board. The most important thing for the surgeons is time. They don't want, especially our hospital, they have usually two rooms. They run one room for the other. And the, the best thing for them is see anesthesiologists is taking little time to do the procedures. So, and I had one of the surgeons actually who was, who was very impressed and he said, I have to film this to show in national meetings that it's possible to do this block in less than a minute. So actually the day I was, he was filming the, the, the block and um, I did since the beginning until the end and he asked me, how long was, do you think it was the block? And I said, probably a minute and a half. And he said it was 55 seconds. And he was so proud. He was like, this is so good. This is so great. You know, like I'm going to show the national meetings that it's possible to do, that it's not necessary to take half an hour to do a block, that you can do this block in a very short time. Very important. Have the surgeons with you. The surgeons have to be with you. All right. So this, uh, the femoral block is becoming old now. It's actually... Uh, fading away more and more, was used to be a very popular block in the early 90s. And now with the adductor canal block coming in, basically the femoral block is almost, um, you don't do it anymore. I do it, the block sometimes when it is necessary. For example, I had a patient with pulmonary hypertension a couple of weeks ago, it was severe pulmonary hypertension for a revision total knee that couldn't do spinal, they couldn't do general, so the combination of femoral block with sciatic. And that works actually very well for the surgery. But they are occasional. It's not 
the, it's not the most common block to do for every surgery. This is another block that was very popular, uh, the lumbar plexus block. I did for every single total hip replacement this block for about 10 years. Um, it's a great block to do, but now because we have a tremendous push in the hospital to get the patients out of the hospital as soon as possible, the patients have to work, have to walk in the recovery room. Finish the surgery, go to the recovery room, four hours, spinal is wear off, and the patients have to walk. So we cannot have a quadriceps uh, uh, weakness because the patients are gonna, not going to walk. Most of our patients in America are obese. BMI of 35, 40, 45 is normal. So we have this large patient with these small physical therapies trying to move the patient out of the bed. That doesn't happen. If the patient has any weakness in the quadriceps, the physical therapist is going to say, you stay in bed. So we have to do um, everything possible to avoid the quadriceps weakness. <clears throat> the popliteal block is also a very popular block. Uh, it has been, you know, it's, it's still running very strong. It has been there for since the late 90s and continue to be a very popular block. Foot surgery. All, almost every patient with foot surgery will have a popliteal block. Um, especially now with the um, dexamethasone. We are using dexamethasone on the local anesthetic, and that is prolonging the block uh, quite a bit. Uh, we have studied this, and um, actually it's working very, very well. The surgeons are in love with it. You know, they don't get the phone calls from the patients, and the patients actually do very well with the analgesia. Okay, so we... <clears throat> Uh, we do, the, again, the lower extremity blocks, uh, we do it for analgesia in combination with a spinal or a combined spinal epidural. The upper extremity blocks, we do it for the surgery. I would say 95 plus percent of the patients going for shoulder surgery will have a upper extremity block, a brachial plexus block, only for the surgery. So they have some sedation, obviously, midazolam, propofol, ketamine, a uh, small amount, so you have the patient relaxed, comfortable, but only with the brachial plexus. And for that reason, the block has to work. Uh, you cannot have a patchy block. You cannot have a block that is taking a while to start. <clears throat> the block has to be very efficient. Again, all the surgeons have two rooms, and they run from one, to, from to one room to another, and they expect when they're walking into the room, the patient is ready to go. There's no, oh my goodness, wait a minute, this happened. Uh, I would not be there if that happened to us. So, interscaling block, supracavicular block, uh, infra and axillary blocks. The most common ones that we do is the interscaling, the supra and the infracavicular. The axillary block used to be a very popular in the past, not anymore, because it's completely taking over the supracavicular block. Uh, the local anesthetic that we use is the combination of bupivacaine and mepivacaine. I know mepivacaine is, is a different a local anesthetic. Not that many places have it. Uh, we use it quite a bit because it lasts a little longer than the lidocaine. Um, and it's a very strong motor block. So you have a good motor block and the patient's not moving at all. And again, we use that for the surgery. And what is changing the last uh, decade or so is the uh, additives. We are experimenting more and more today with different additives. We want to prolong the block. We, are, we want to make the block last longer. Um, so a dexamethasone is one of them, and we have experimented with clonidine, with propionorphine, with neostigmine, and we are still in the process of doing some studies to show that there might be a, more time for the analgesia. So interscaling block is my favorite, definitely, with not, without any question. Uh, the problem with the interscaling block uh, is that you have side effects. So when I was uh, you know, in the 90s, <clears throat> we used to do the interscaling block with paresthesia. I don't know if anybody have heard that or have done it. Uh, maybe the gray hair in the, in the audience here have done it. Uh, we used to be like you have the patient 
uh, feel the interscaling groove, put the needle on the neck with the patient awake, and the patient will tell you if you have the paresthesia in the hands or the shoulder, and then you inject the local anesthetic. So it was a landmark block, and the, the block used to for the surgery, not for the analgesia. So again, the block had to work. So back then, in those days, we used high volume local anesthetic. Believe it or not, 50, 60 ml of local anesthetic in the neck. It was a good block, but you had so many side effects. Um, the main side effects, you get the stellar ganglion, Horner syndrome, you get the uh, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, you get the phrenic nerve, so the patients are hoarse, the difficulty to breathe deeply, uh, but that's the way that it was to be in the past. Now with the ultrasound, the volumes are coming down and down and down, and we are experimenting with that too. Um, and I will talk about that later when I show some studies that have, we have been done. So the supracavicular block is uh, also a good block. Um, it's usually um, used for the shoulder surgery too. Traditionally, this block was not, was not a, a, a block for shoulders. Uh, if you have done any of those in the past, it used to be a good block for elbows and hand, but not for shoulders. With the ultrasound, we place the, the needle in different positions. We place the needle inside the, the, the plexus, and actually the block was quite successful for shoulder surgery. So we got very enthusiastic uh, about that and decided, well, maybe we do supracavicular block and we are not going to have the side effects of the interscaling. So for about five years or so, in the 2008-2009, we, all of us start doing supracavicular block. And back, back then, at the same time, I was invited to give the, um, uh, a lecture in India, in the south of India. And what's interesting of this, this meeting is that it was a live surgery and a live anesthesia. So here I was in the operating room uh, with the cameras, and uh, so we have the audience was in a different floor. They have a split, uh, a split image on the in the front with my, my view of my hands and with the ultrasound machine. Um, I, got, I was late for the operating room, was a lot of traffic. Um, so when I got there, everything was ready. And you see uh, this guy here, see that he's a little down and worried about, he was the chief of the anesthesia department there. So I met them right in the operating room and I said, and he asked me, what are you going to do for this patient? It's a shoulder surgery. And I ask, I tell, I'm going to do a supracavicular block. The people in the south of India, they are a dark color. And all of a sudden, he, he went white. I said, he paused and he said, a supracavicular block? Supracavicular block, they don't work for shoulders. He was a very experienced anesthesiologist. And I said to him, you are correct, but we have, we have been trying a different technique for the supracavicular with the ultrasound. <clears throat> and it's working quite good. And he take a deep breath and say, well, you see that patient? The patient is a morbidly obese patient, BMI of 45. I said, that's OK. There's no problem. But she also was asthmatic. She has a severe asthma and took us like two weeks to get her ready for the surgery. She, she cannot have general anesthesia. I said, no problem. And then he paused again and he said, not only that, this patient is the wife of the most prominent politicians here in this area. Well, I just didn't say anything. <laughs> um, so here I was doing the block, and I was thinking, oh my God, what I am doing here? But I kept it. I, kept, I did a supracavicular block. Actually, it was quite successful. I was asking the patient to move the left arm. Uh, she was moving, so she was responding to me, and I asked her to move the right arm with the operating, operating arm, and she couldn't, absolutely couldn't move. So I test, you know, all the dermatomas was completely numb, and the, the surgery actually was quite successful. The guy was actually very impressed, and I became dark again, as thank God. <clears throat> um, so the infracavicular block is another very successful block. We use this for all the hand surgery. Um, uh, for the surgery itself, again, we do everything in the hand. We have a very good surgeons doing hand surgery there, and they do everything from little tiny, uh, you know, carpal tunnels to, to big uh, wrist prostheses and things like that. 
All right, so I'm gonna shift a little bit the talk. Uh, this is a picture of my country. I'm from South America, actually. If you know, you recognize, but it's Machu Picchu. If you have never been there, I really highly recommend it. It's a very easy trip and it's, it's very beautiful. So think about it. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about total knee replacement. Uh, as well, we know, if you have done knee replacements, they are extremely challenging. Uh, why is that? It's a very painful operation. Uh, they do uh, eight to nine cuts on the two major bones in the, in the body, and it really hurts. So we have to uh, make them comfortable, uh, but all, not only make them comfortable for the, because of the pain, but have to make them comfortable because the patient has to move. The, op the success of the operation depends upon the movement of the patient. The patient has to move, and they have to move quick. They cannot stay in bed for two, three, four days because there are going to be some complications. The, the, the knee are going to be moving. They're going to have more pain. And it's a sequence of events that goes to the, knee, the, the, oper, the, the failure of the operation. And there are many ways to control the pain. I've been a VPCA, epidural infusion, peripheral nerve blocks, multimodal analgesia, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the combination of those. And we have been everywhere. We have done pretty much experimenting with all the, all the type of modalities and the combination of those, and I will explain what are we doing now. The goals, again, of this operation is obviously pain control, but not only pain control, but you have to minimize the side effects. Why is that? For the comfort of the patient, and only also for the, the patient have to move. You cannot move a patient that is nauseated, that is dizzy, that is groggy, so you have to have control in the side effects so the patient can move. You cannot have a patient with motor weakness. And that's why the femoral block is out of favor today. Because they don't want to have, they don't want to have motor weakness. The patient has to be able to move right after the surgery. In, um, we have a big problem today in America because of the chronic pain and the addiction of the opioids. It's a, a big epidemic right now. And uh, there is a lot of pressure from every side to decrease the amount of opioids. And obviously, with regional anesthesia, we can do that. Uh, we live in Manhattan, Upper East Side. Uh, the patients are incredible demanding. You cannot believe how demanding they are. So we have to meet these expectations from them. and. Uh, so we have to keep the patients comfortable as much as we can to meet the, the expectations that they have. So RHSS, uh, in 2018, uh, we have, for the surgery, a spinal, or a combined spinal epidural. And for the analgesia afterwards, we do a combination of a ductal canal block, IPAP block, the multimodal analgesia, and in that, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but we have been playing around with different drugs. And the last is the periarticular injections. Most likely you all have heard about this. It's the injection that the surgeons provide during the operation into the operating field. And this we call the cocktail. And this cocktail is a combination of different medications. We have been playing with that around also, um, but it's actually quite successful. So, how do we get to this? Um, this is a very famous and popular study that done with Dr. Capdevila, Xavier Capdevila, French anesthesiologist in the 90s. And in this study, he showed that the time for the patients to be in the hospital was five to seven days and was a great improvement uh, from the 14 days that they had before. Um, obviously, this uh, five to seven days back then was an important, was a good thing. Today is, is, is a disaster. We cannot have our patients for seven days in the hospital. The hospital will, will go broke. We have a, it's a private hospital that requires the patient to move around. They cannot stay too long in the hospital because it's costly, and you can have more complications too. So, 
we study this and we decide, can we, can we improve the time of the discharge? Um, so this is study um, uh, back then, it was in the, in the 2007, 2008, that we came with the idea. Can we change the, uh, the, the analgesia that we're doing at the moment, which, is, which was the uh, epidural infusion afterwards with the single shot femoral block? Can we compare this with the new technique that is coming now, which was the periarticular injections? Um, and we did. And we, we show that both groups actually are equivalent. So the periarticular injections are, in terms of pain, in terms of side effects, uh, in terms of opiate consumptions, are the same as the infusion of the, of the epidural plus the femoral block. Not only that, but was also the same that the patient was ready to go home. So, and that time was about three days. So we said, well, we are improving. The patients back then were about five to six days in the 90s. Now we have three days in the hospital. And then we said, okay, that's, that's fantastic. So we have this periarticular injection that is working very well. Can we add the adductor canal block to it? But is the adductor canal as good as the femoral block? Because that was the way that we were doing back then, femoral blocks. Um, so we studied and um, we compared both groups. And indeed, the adductor canal block, in terms of analgesia, was equivalent to the femoral block. The same opioid consumptions and the same pain scores. But what was different for this is that the strength of the patient, the strength of the quadriceps was quite higher in the adductor canal block. You can see here the adductor canal block, the numbers for the dynamometer readings are higher and the femoral block are lower. So we have, we're able to show that the femoral block and the adductor canal are the same in terms of, analg of analgesia, the same on, in terms of opioid consumptions, but it's better in terms of motor weakness. So now we get very excited about it. And then now, can we combine the adductor canal block with the periarticular injections? Uh, this is a project that I was involved. I was always the primary investigator on this project. Uh, it took me like four years to get it off the ground. And the reason why is I said, let's go, all the departments work together to create a protocol that actually is the best. So we got the surgeons, we got the physical therapists, and we got the anesthesiologists to create a protocol that is going to make the patients go faster in the recovery. Uh, it took me a while to get it off the ground, it took me a while to do it, and now it's taking me a while to publish. I just finished last week the third revision for the journal, uh, JBJS, uh, to, to publish. So I think it's going to be published in the next couple of months or so. But I presented in abstract last year in San Francisco in the ASHRA meeting. This was the main anesthesia meeting, uh, main uh, regional anesthesia meeting in the country. So what, what it was all about this is just comparing two groups. One, periarticular injections only, and two, periarticular injections plus the ductal canal. And I decide to put the primary outcome as the time that the patient is ready to be discharged from the hospital. Back then, the average time was three days. So let's, let's, go if, let's see if we can reduce that time. Um, and when I'm talking about ready to be discharged, means that the patient has to clear the stairs by themselves. So we start this study and starting to do the physical therapy, very enthusiastic. Everybody was very enthusiastic. And we had two patients that were ready to go home in the recovery room. So surgery finished, his spinal and wear off, and the patient walked with a walker, the patient walked with a cane, and the patient cleared the stairs. So that means that the patient had minimal pain or no pain at all, 
the patient had minimum side effects or no side effects, no nausea, no grogging. He was actually clear in the, in the mind, so he became motivated, and he had no motor weakness. So, <clears throat> overall, it was about, about 106 patients that we did, and the mean time that the patients were ready to go home was a little bit more than 24 hours. So it was about 31 and 35 hours in both groups. Um, was no difference in terms of statistics, statistically different, was no difference in between both groups. Uh, was, this, was a clear trend towards the patient that had the adductor canal in all the measurements, in the pain, in the opioid consumption, uh, in the physical therapy, in the time for discharge, but was very little a statistical difference. So we can say that actually, if you add the adductor canal, to the particular injections doesn't improve much in terms overall, in terms of pain, in terms of uh, side effects, and in terms of time of discharge. Then we said, with the IPAC came in, and can we add the IPAC to this mixture? So this, is, this study was just published uh, two weeks ago. Actually, I got the email that we got accepted to ANA, anesthesia, and analgesia. So we add that IPAC. So we have the two groups, the particular injection, and we have the particular injection plus the doctor canal plus the IPAC. Can we show any difference between those two groups? The primary outcome was uh, pain of ambulation. It was not discharge time. It was the time, the, the, the pain that the patient had during uh, ambulation on PO number one. And in this particular study, we show that there is a difference. Actually, it was difference in all of the measures that we did. <clears throat> but the primary outcome um, had less pain with ambulate in the first day after surgery. I'm almost done. OK. <clears throat> so the next study that we are uh, working on, and we, so we're almost ready to launch, is the catheters. So when we do this block, the block lasts for a certain time. Usually for the dexamethasone, it's about 24 to 36 hours, and you have some rebound pain. When the block wears off, the patient has some pain. So can we continue with that analgesia afterwards? So the catheters, the doctor can have catheters come in, and we are doing it more and more. I do actually one at least every couple of days. Um, and we can send the patients home with it. So we do a doctor canal catheter, send the patient home, and the, we avoid the rebound pain. It's still, we're still working on it, and I think in the next couple of years we have more answers for that. <coughs> right? And a picture of Machu Picchu, if you have not been convinced, I would highly recommend it to go there. So I'm just going to mention very briefly about two more modalities that we do, total hip replacement and total shoulder replacement. For the total hip replacement, um, it's a very particular technique that was, uh, uh, was brought by Dr. Sharok at HSS in, in, the 80s, in the late 80s, and this hypotensive epidural anesthesia. What is basically is, <clears throat> is we do these uh, hips with um, uh, a combined spinal epidural, and we create a high sympathectomy from the local anesthetic on the spinal or in, in the epidural. So the patients will have a profound hypotension, uh, but with the use of epinephrine, we're going to preserve the cardiac output. That's basically the basis of this technique. Um, why we're doing that? Uh, it's a bloodless feel. Uh, for the surgeons that have been doing this for a while, they're actually requesting all the time the technique. And the, some of them, they're asking, what is the pressure? Because pressure higher, more bleeding. Pressure lower, less bleeding. <clears throat> we keep usually the pressures between 50. I keep it a little lower than that, between 48 and 50, the mean arterial, arterial pressure. That decreases the bilion's return, that the heart rate is going to increase slightly, at least preserved, uh, a stable CVP. And we're going to increase the stroke volume to about 15 to 25%. 
And the most important part of this technique is we maintain the cardiac output. Uh, many studies have been done in the literature. Dr. Sharrock is the main uh, guy proving that it's okay to do it. We can do this technique safely in the CNS, on the kidneys, on the heart, and even the older patients. So I'm gonna show you just a little bit of the, <clears throat> this is a, our typical operating room. Uh, the patient is, is not there yet, getting ready for the surgery. The patient got into the operating room, uh, the heart rate 62, the O2 sat 99 percent, and the blood pressure 149 over 79, and the time is 11 o'clock. This is a real case. I didn't change anything at all. Um, uh, came, uh, came actually very nicely. The sequen uh, sequence came back very nicely. The patient is getting ready, position, the lateral position. Uh, back then, I was about seven years old. This, uh, these pictures were doing lumbar plexus block for every single total hip replacement, getting ready for it. The needle is in, injecting the local anesthetic. Uh, the paramedian technique, CSC, that's the epidural needle. That's the fellow doing it. Epidural catheter is in place. And 1116, heart rate, O2SAT, and blood pressure. Patient is finished being positioned. Uh, pressure starts coming down, 1128. See that? The pressure is at the mean of 60. <clears throat> Surgery started and bloodless. The way that you can tell that the patient is going to bleed or not, when they made an incision on the skin, there is blood on the skin, the patient will bleed, require more hypotension. If there is no blood in the skin, the patient is not going to bleed. So this is a bloodless uh, skin. And that's the pressure that we usually keep, mean of 48. This is the last, you see the recording. Uh, the patient came in at 10.50, the time is right here. The pressure is the way up to about 150, 149. We saw that in the beginning. And it started coming down, 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 all the way down, doing the case. And at the end, it started going up again, right? That's about 1230. So that's a typical uh, tracing of, the, of this technique. And the last thing, I'm running out of time here, right? Uh, is anesthesia for total shoulder replacement. I'm just gonna show a couple of slides there. Again, we are doing this with brachial plexus block only, not general anesthesia, uh, to do that with the brachial plexus. We um, used to do that with high volumes, and it started coming down more and more and more. And then with the ultrasound, we saw that it's possible to give less volume, and the brachial plexus is all with local anesthetic. So we don't need to put 60 or 40 or 50 mLs. So we start coming down and actually work quite well. So um, we study this and we decide, can we compare 20 or 40 ml? Again, this is for the surgery, not for analgesia afterwards. And these two groups, one group 20 ml, the 40 ml of local anesthetic. And we saw that re in the reality, there's no problem. We can do, the surgery is good, the motor block is good, uh, the quality of the anesthesia is good with 20 ml. We don't need the 40 ml for the surgery to do this, uh, this technique. And there is less side effects, less hoarseness, and especially the stellar ganglion block. You know, you have the pitosis, the midrosis, and nitrosis that we have with the high volumes. So we got very enthusiastic. And another problem, another thing that we had with this technique is that the hand was preserved. So we went interscaling block all the way up, low volume, less side effects, and the hand was moving at the end of the surgery, which was a problem before for the patients because they did not like to have, to have the, 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 hand, the hand numb. The surgeons that they do total shoulder replacement, they know that there is a complication from the surgery. They, they injure the brachial plexus and they can have some, some brachial plex plexopathy, so they want to see the hand movement. With this technique, decreasing the volume, we were seeing the hand movement. So we have a patient now with, they are comfortable for the surgery, they are comfortable afterwards, the hand is moving. Can we prolong the block? Can we prolong the block? So we started experimenting with the additives, and um, 
this is actually on, on my last slide, and uh, we add to this mix of local anesthetic dexamethasone, we add clonidine, and we add buprenorphine. And that was quite successful because we are prolonging the block to 36, and we have some patients 48 hours after surgery. So they are comfortable with the shoulder, the hand is moving, so it's all good. So for the interscaling, for the total shoulder replacement, recommendations, interscaling block for surgical anesthesia, low volume local anesthetic, and the use of additives to prolong the block. So in conclusion, I would say anesthesia for orthopedic surgery, my first suggestion is regional anesthesia, the second suggestion is regional, and the third is regional anesthesia again. Thank you very much. That was good. Thanks very much, uh, Enrique, for that fantastic talk. Um, so, uh, we've got a couple of minutes before we kick off before our next talk. Um, yeah, so we'll, we've got a, a few minutes for a couple of questions uh, for Dr. Goy Tazolo. We've got the extra mics uh, rolling around there with some of the ASA volunteers. Um, if not, uh, Gilberto, I might get you to come and... Uh, we've got the second mic out there. Yep, here it's coming just now. All right, sorry, yeah, so questions just right here in the middle. Gilberto, I might get you just to run the mic if that's okay. So I'll just repeat the question, if I can recall all three components. Uh, Rapivacaine versus bupivacaine, uh, dose of dexamethasone, was it? And uh, local anaesthetic toxic doses uh, when we're doing a multitude of uh, regional anaesthesia techniques. I might get to that. That's, that's a great question. The, the rapivacaine is more expensive um, and has not shown much difference for us in terms of length of the surgery, quality of the block. So we stick with the bupivacaine. Uh, Ropiva can be almost, almost exclusively used for the catheters afterwards. For the day of day, bupiva can is the, the drug of choice. Uh, the dexamethasone, we start with low doses and we are getting more encouraged, so we are bumping up the doses. And the maximum dose that we use is four milligrams. It's a very nice study that was published between eight and four, and there's no difference between both of them. And the last, the very good question about how much local anesthetics can you give. You're given the periarticular injections, we're given the adductor canal and the, the IPAC. So we're doing it. Uh, our regular technique will be 15 cc's of quarter percent uh, bupivacaine in the IPAC, 15 cc's of quarter percent in the adductor canal, and 50 cc's of half percent in the periarticular injections. Um, the time is different. We do the First, the, the blocks, and at the end, the periodical injection. So there's a little bit of time between, so it gives a little bit more safety. And we have not had any problems, and we do quite a bit with this technique. Last so, year was about 4,500 uh, uh, knee replacements, um, and it's working actually well. I was, just gonna, I was just doing some quick calculations on those doses you said. So to, to my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 130 mils of 0.25% bupivacaine being used. Uh, for, for that technique. Does that sound about right? Anybody else who managed to add those up and convert them quickly? Um, just as a uh, follow-up to that question, Enrique, I wanted to ask you about liposomal bupivacaine. Is this something that you've looked at at HSS for yeah. prolongation? Uh, they are trying to, they're pushing very hard and they, they came to us actually to do this study uh, about maybe six years ago. And uh, we said we can do it, but they want to control the statistics and they want to control the design of the study. And you say, well, you cannot do that. So if either we control the statistics and control the design of the study, or there's no, there's no study. And so they, they left. It's basically not working. The, the studies are there. There's, like a, there's plenty of literature saying that the liposomal bupivacaine is, is not beneficial against the normal bupivacaine. And, and the studies are all there. 
So it's not on the cards at HSS anytime oh, soon. It's expensive. Any other questions uh, from the floor there? Thanks, Gilberto, up the back. Sorry, just give us one moment. Sorry, just behind you. It was a classic case of uh, mistaken identity. Look, uh, <laughs> um, I was just wondering to what extent um, in, across the entire board of the surgery do patients are receiving any kind of uh, sedative or anxiolytic drugs? Can you repeat the question? So uh, that was just a question in regards to this, the sedation techniques for yeah, regional yes. anesthesia? Yes, whether, whether these patients are in fact completely unsedated or yeah, yeah. variable degrees? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, have, if you have been in New York City, it's, it's pe people are, are kind of like a little crazy. So they, they, they want to be asleep. They don't want to know anything. They don't want to feel anything. And I have to tell them before, when I meet them in the, in, before the surgery, the first thing I say to them is, don't you worry, you're not going to feel anything. As soon as you go into the operating room, the, f the next thing you will remember is waking up in the recovery room. And they, they finally, they, okay. So we have to sedate the patients. I do sedate the patients. Obviously, every patient is different. All the patients, patients are taking opioids in the past, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, you know, the antidepressants. We have a lot of them there. So uh, you have to sedate them more. So my... If I can give you a mix with five milligrams of midazolam plus propofol and sometimes some ketamine. But the main sedation is the midazolam plus the propofol. I keep a syringe of propofol on the IV while I'm doing my block so I can keep giving the propofol to them. Make sure that they are asleep, they are comfortable. If you don't give any, any narcotics to that combination, you, you are a little safer with the, with the, with the airway. With the narcotics, then the, the respiration actually depressed. So I keep the midazolam and the propofol, both of them, and that's it. Great. I think there was another question just down here in the green shirt, Gilberto. Uh, just while the microphone's coming down, I was going to say there's no better man for the job uh, for that demonstration you did in India. You seem like an expert in managing the demanding patient, Enrique. So <laughs> next question. Thank you for the great talk. Um, just a quick question. When you're doing your shoulder surgeries just under a brachial plexus block, yeah. <clears throat> are you doing additional blocks as well, like a superficial cervical plexus or intercostal brachial or anything? No. The, the total shoulders, the incision is made in the anterior shoulder. Usually, the, it, there's no need to cover anything else. Sometimes, they, they have to go a little bit more medial, and the lower part of the incision is not covered, is the T2 intercostal brachial nerve. So for those, I usually look at the incision, I, I tell the surgeon, can you please give some local anesthetic on the bottom of the incision? And that's, that's all you have to do. Wonderful, and just to follow up with regards to using a um, superclav block, yeah. do you then go in the superficial lateral component of the plexus when you're trying to use <clears throat> shoulder surgery? For, for you to be able to do the shoulder surgery, they have to, you, know, you have to really actually go into the plexus. So, I go in between the artery and the plexus and separate the plexus, and sometimes you skew a little two or three cc's inside. So that you see a little, a little you know, dilatation of the plexus, that actually make it work very well. Great, okay, we, we might wrap up the questions there. Hopefully we'll have a bit of an opportunity for the panel at the end of the session as well. So I'll just pop this mic down. So I'd just like to thank Enrique again for a fantastic talk. Okay, so for our uh, second talk of the morning, um, uh, very pleased to uh, be inviting Associate Professor Michael Barrington to the stage. Probably a name very familiar to a lot of people uh, in the Australian audience here. He's uh, renowned worldwide for his, uh, his uh, long uh, time work uh, and passion for regional anaesthesia in terms of uh, uh, anatomical studying as well as setting up uh, uh, robust training uh, techniques for trainees and a next generation of regional anaesthetists. So Dr Michael Barrington is a senior staff anaesthesiologist at St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne and associate professor at the University of Melbourne. He's responsible for the development of an international registry of regional anaesthesia. His professional interests include quality and safety in regional anaesthesia and methods to improve training and assessment in this field. Other professional activities and appointments include anaesthesia discipline lead for the Melbourne Clinical School, the University of Notre Dame, Australia, associate editor for the journal Regional Anaesthesia and Pain Medicine, chair of the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists Regional Anaesthesia SIG, 
organising committee for the Australasian Symposium for Ultrasound and Regional Anaesthesia in 2008, 2009, 12 and 15, newsletter committee and neurological practice advisory member for the American Society of Regional Anaesthesia and Pain Medicine and is on medical expert standing panels for the Federal Department of, of Health and Ageing Australia's. So I'm very appreciative that he's found some time in his extremely busy schedule uh, to come and present to us all this morning on an update on interfascial plane blocks, anatom anatomical concepts, mechanisms, indications and techniques. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Associate Professor Michael Barrington to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind, thorough introduction. So I'm just going to connect up my computer. Just to, just to briefly address the pre, uh, previous question about the correct dose of dexamethasone, Brian Williams has done a lot of the research on this, and the correct dose, the upper limit of dose of dexamethasone that, that should be used based on his research is two milligrams per 20 mil of injectate. So two milligrams per 20 mil, two milligrams per 20 mil of injectate. Sometimes I see the trainees or people wanting to put in a whole ampule of four milligrams, but that exceeds the existing safety data recommendations. So uh, get talking on my topic uh, on interfascial plane blocks, which uh, have been popular for a long time, but lately they've really taken off. Amazing enthusiasm for some of the new plane blocks. We'll talk about the anatomy, um, try and give some insights into how these blocks work, suggest some indications and, and talk a little bit about techniques. I have no disclosures to make. Uh, I do acknowledge research support from the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. So there's a lot of factors which are influencing practice and it was brought up in the previous um, presentation, the opioid issues that we face and in the United States there's an opioid crisis, there's an opioid epidemic, but even in Australia there's evidence of a massive increase in prescription opioid use, and with that there's evidence of increased morbidity associated with, with that. Apart from that, it's much, we're much more likely now, compared to 20 years ago, to see our patients who are opioid tolerant, and sometimes they're profoundly opioid tolerant to the analgesic effects, and sometimes they have opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So managing these patients can be very demanding, and this has been one of the factors that's really driven the use of plane blocks and the development of these new interfascial plane blocks. Certainly the pressure to um, you know, have our techniques that conform to an ERAS clinical pathway is incredibly important, but ERAS by itself has been shown to reduce length of stay, reduce complications, and in some circumstances reduce, reduce uh, opioid requirements. So we must remember that the techniques, our local anaesthetic techniques that we're offering our patients are not the only um, strategies that we can use. Certainly the um, advent of some of the plan blocks has paralleled the development of minimally invasive surgery um, and the surgical cohort that we're dealing with is much more complex, frail uh, and, and aged compared to 20 years ago. I think compared to 20 years ago or, or even sorry 10 years ago the number of an anaesthetic practitioners who are now competent with ultrasound has increased dramatically. So therefore, when a new block is published, put on YouTube, for example, there's massive uptake and our, um, our combined experience is really uh, quite large and grows much more quickly than it did 10 years ago. The classic example, I guess, uh, one classic example of a plain block is the, the humble fascial iliaca block. And uh, as we know, we inject local anaesthetic under the fascial iliaca two thirds of the distance from the pubic tubicle to the anterior superior iliac spine. And this was developed to meet a need, and that was to decrease the discomfort associated with the paresthesia uh, or nerve stimulator femoral block technique, particularly in pediatrics. There's evidence that this block works, uh, for example, um, in positioning patients who've got proximal fractures of the femur. It provides improved analgesia if we put this before we try and sit the patient up or position them for a spinal for the surgery. And so there's evidence that it improves uh, analgesia in that, circumstance, in that setting. Following hip arthroplasty, this is a study from New York, they compared ultrasound-guided fascial block to a, a sham block 
And this was in a group of patients who were already in pain in PACU following hip arthroplasty, but they really found that there was no difference in the opioid consumption at 24 hours between the two groups, local anesthetic or saline. So why is this? Well, there could be several reasons. First of all, hip arthroplasty itself is probably not associated with a great deal of pain, very different to a knee joint replacement. And in a non-opioid tolerant patient, probably a robust multimodal oral mixture will suffice. The other reason why it may not have been effective is because the innovation of the hip is complex, as we know, and also their direction of local anaesthetic injectate was from lateral to medial, which means that the local anaesthetic was you know, primarily directed to the femoral nerve. If it had been directed to phallid, perhaps, or more proximal, perhaps, it would have been more likely to involve the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Of course, there's other ways we can perform it. We can perform the fascial arca block or femoral block, depending on what you want to call it, using an outer plane technique and really accurately locate the local anesthetic in the correct plane. And we inject out of plane like this, it's possible, as I said, be mentioned before, we'll get more proximal spread of local anesthetic. Another technique is, and described by Peter Hebbard, is the ultrasound guided supra inguinal fascial arca block. And here, the transducer is placed on the anterior superior iliac spine in the sagittal plane and then translating the transducer medially, keeping a single, similar angulation, the transducer will now be over the anterior inferior iliac spine, and then we inject local anaesthetic using an in-plane technique um, above the iliacus muscle. And um, one thing I'd just like to point out is just up here, there's a vessel at the deep circumflex iliac artery, and when we are in the correct plane, the deep circumflex iliac artery, which is superficial to the fascia iliaca, should move up. So this is a, a technique that we can use. I would specifically recommend this in patients with fractured neck of femur. So does this improve outcome? This study is from Belgium, where they looked at the 24-hour morphine um, consumption, fascia iliaca block compared to controlled, and, and there was a difference in opioid consumption at 24 hours using this technique in the context of hip arthroplasty. One thing that they didn't do is that they didn't really give us any indication as to if this block caused motor block, whether it impaired early mobilization. They didn't really present any uh, early mobilization metrics. If you look at the Cochrane review, there's quite uh, high quality evidence that fascia iliaca block and femoral nerve block um, improve pain um, 30 minutes after block placement. I think this is significant because often when you look at Cochrane reviews, they seem reluctant to declare that any therapy has any real evidence. So this is significant. So I recommend that femoral nerve blocks or fascial arca blocks use the use of patients routinely if they have proximal fractures of the femur. The Association of Great Britain and Ireland also recommends specifically femoral nerve blocks and fascial arca blocks for patients with this condition as part of a multifaceted, multidisciplinary management. So we're going to move on to uh, the abdomen now, the torso, and the transverse abdominus plane block is like the quintessential ultrasound guided block. I would say that five or ten years ago it was one of the most popular blocks performed worldwide. It still probably is. Certainly in the United States, I think it was, you know, five years ago it was probably the most popular block performed. Um, it's, it's ease of performance largely relates to the ease of identification of the large anterolateral wall muscles, uh, the external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis. The ability to identify them with sonography has really led to the popularity, popularity of this technique. And the lateral tap block was described first, and the goal is to inject local anaesthetic in the neurovascular plane where the thoracolumbar nerves lie between the transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscles. A subcostal approach was uh, described where we inject closer to the costal margin and closer to the ziphy sternum. And again, um, very similar endpoint, injecting between in the neurovascular plane, very reliable, consistent sonographic endpoint contributing to its popularity. Tap blocks also suitable for catheter techniques and there's an e some evidence that tap blocks when given by continuous infusion, they're at least in volunteers, that there's um, the, the regression of the sensory block is, is slowed down. So 
you want to get a more bang for your buck then a catheter is very suitable. Clearly the advantages are simplicity and ease of performance as I've mentioned. It can be used as a rescue block and pack you without needing to change the patient's position. It's, it's been used in patients with chronic pain conditions and it can be performed in unresponsive patients without any controversy. The disadvantages of the TAP is limited sensory block. If you want to anaesthetise the entire abdominal wall, you have to do four injections above, um, you have to do a lateral TAP block and also a subcostal TAP block. And even then you may get inconsistent blockade to, that covers the entire abdominal wall. And also it provides somatic analgesia, it doesn't provide visceral analgesia. One thing that's of note is that if you do want to get proximal spread, I recommend injecting local anaesthetic very close, um, sorry, cephalid spread, you inject local anaesthetic very close to the ziphi sternum in the plane between the transverse abdominis and rectus muscles because you're more likely, I believe, to get the, the higher thoracolumbar nerves in that location. There is a red flag, of course, with tap blocks and it probably applies to all of the um, the plain blocks because we tend to give large volumes and large doses of local anaesthetics with these blocks and that's local anaesthetic systemic toxicity and this became particularly evident in the obstetric population, not surprisingly. And it's important that we adjust our dosages of local anaesthetic according to age, weight, comorbidities and physiologic conditions. Dr. Hesham from the Western Hospital in Melbourne did a very good study and she showed that in continuous infusions of local anaesthetics in the tap plane, the, the serum concentrations of ropivacaine continued to go up um, for several days. And so we, and some of the, some of the dosage, some of the serum concentrations are close to the doses, some close to the concentrations that could cause toxicity. So we have to be mindful of that when we run local anaesthetics um, post-operatively, particularly for several days. So the key points from the literature on tap block is that following laparoscopic surgery, and that really represents a large proportion of our work now, tap block reduces early but not late pain scores at rest, but it has a minimal effect on dyna dynamic pain, reduces opioid requirements but not opioid related side effects. And in many of the studies, the tap blocks were compared to controls in the absence of concurrent multimodal therapy, which may have exaggerated the treatment effect of the tap block. It's important to note that we should be implementing multimodal therapy at every opportunity if our goal is to reduce post-operative pain. Clearly, that's why we're there. That's critical to early recovery and mobilisation. This study by, again, from the Hospital for Special Sur Surgery by Stavros Matsudis, who would be well known to many people. He looked at pain management modalities, including peripheral nerve block and a range of uh, oral and intravenous adjuncts that are known to be opioid sparing and looked at outcomes such as opioid related complications, the use of opioid prescriptions, length and cost of hospitalization. And what he found was there was a stepwise increase in the benefit with increasing the number of pain management modalities. So one, two, two modalities was better than one, three was better than two, for example. And interestingly, the, the strongest association for improved outcomes, including opioid related side effects was the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and cyclooxygenase inhibitors. And there's high quality evidence and strong recommendations from practice advisories and, and um, professional groups that multimodal oral analgesia should be used routinely following surgery. If we go back to tap block and look at the latest meta-analysis, this was published in 2015 and their primary outcome was opioid um, consumption at six hours and they documented there was a reduction in, in morphine equivalent of six milligrams at six hours. This benefit continued on for to 24 hours. And I'll leave it to you to decide whether you think this is clinically significant in your practice. Just like to touch base on the use of meta-analyses, and this is really relevant now, and this is not a critique of the previous meta-analysis, which had a large number of studies and a large number of patients, but particularly in the plain block era, we're seeing meta-analyses being published after three or four randomised controlled trials, sometimes six, and it's really um, something that we should be very wary about. This study by Dr. Siva Kumar from Melbourne is really interesting and their null hypothesis was that the number of significant and non-significant endpoints 
would be significant uh, if a large randomized controlled trial was compared to a previously performed meta-analysis on the same topic in perioperative medicine. In other words, the meta-analysis was performed first and showed a particular result with a particular treatment effect. And then subsequent to that, a large randomized control trial was performed using the same endpoints on the same topic. And what they found was that only one in five meta-analyses correctly predicted the results of a subsequent randomized control trial using the same endpoint. So why is that? Well, often the early randomized controlled trials have very small number of patients. Often they're performed, executed by the early adopters, by the enthusiasts, and often the treatment effect is exaggerated in those early randomized controlled trials that is not subsequently demonstrated in a more mature, uh, more carefully executed um, and managed randomized controlled trial. So something to think about. So like Consistent with many of the plane blocks, there's versions and evolution. So you get, you know, block A, block B, block C. This has certainly been the case with the TAP block. And shortly after the development of the TAP block, there was increased interest in posterior injection of local anaesthetic and increased interest of injecting local anaesthetic using ultrasound guidance in a location similar to the original landmark technique where local anaesthetic was injected through the triangle of Pettit um, posterior and close to the iliac crest. And the posterior approach to the tap block became known very quickly as the quadratus lumborum block and the initial description re revolved around injecting local anaesthetic on the lateral border of the quadratus lumborum muscle um, close to where the anterolateral antero abdominal wall muscles intersect with the paraspinal muscles. The quadratus lumborum muscle is a small uh, muscle of the posterior abdominal wall. It's attached to the iliac crest posteromedially and it's attached to the transverse processes of L1 to L4 and the medial border of the 12th rib. And this is a critical structure if we're going to perform this. The thoracolumbar fascia has been described using a two layer and a three layer model. I'm not going to talk about that in a lot of detail because it's a little bit theoretical and probably wouldn't impact on the block. But I'd just like, to, like you to just focus on one part of the anatomy up here. If you look at where the anterolateral, anterolateral wall muscles intersect with the paraspinal muscles, there's an area here called the lumbar interfascial triangle. And I'll explain this in, in a little bit more detail. But first of all, the, um, quadrat the erector spinae muscles, which are here, the erector spinae muscles the erector spina muscles comprise three muscles, multifidus, longissimus, and iliocostalis. And then adjacent to that, we've got the anterolateral wall muscles abutting the paraspinal muscles, quadratus lumborum, and psoas major. So it's a very sort of busy area. The, the thoracolumbar fascia is likely a key structure here. And the thoracolumbar fascia comprises a superficial layer and a deep layer, and I'm now referring to the posterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia. The posterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia surrounds the erector spinae muscle. So regardless of what model that you see that's talked about, the posterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia surrounds the erector spinae muscle. It has a superficial layer which is partly derived from the fascia of the latissimus dorsi. It has a deep layer which is known as the paraspinal retinacular sheath. And this layer is probably possibly critical to the performance of the quadratus lumborum block and the myofascial um, uh, structures of the internal oblique and the transverse abdominus, when they reach the paraspinal muscles laterally, they split and join the paraspinal sheath, which is the deep layer of the posterior thoracolumbar fascia. And in the lumbar interfascial triangle there, in the, lumbar, in the lumbar interfascial triangle is possibly a very good place to inject local anaesthetic because you're effectively injecting local anaesthetic into the thoracolumbar fascia. So that's something to keep in mind. There's been three approaches described for quadratus lumborum. There's a lateral approach where we inject on the lateral border of the quadratus lumborum and that was the first technique. There's a posterior technique where the local anaesthetic is injected underneath the thoracolumbar fascia posteriorly and this is clearly a simpler technique because the, 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 the target is more 
the target is more superficial. And then there's an anterior technique, anterior quadratus lumborum block, where we inject between quadratus lumborum and psoas. And that's a little bit more invasive in some of our patients. How does this block work? Well, regardless of what model you see to describe the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia, the fascial tissue that lines the inside of the abdominal wall is the transversus um, fascia. And the transversus fascia, when it reaches the arcuate ligament of the diaphragm and then splits into two layers, one layer is continuous with the endothoracic fascia and the other layer joins the diaphragm. And so there's a well-described connection or pathway between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. And there's been older studies that have shown with posterior tap blocks and also more recent studies with quadratus lumborum block that when we inject into these planes that there's spread of local anaesthetic to the, the lower paravertebral space. So this is one potential mechanism of action of quadratus lumborum block. There's been five cadaver studies to date on quadratus lumborum, and most of them have a small number of specimens. Most of them include three techniques, lateral, anterior, and posterior. I'm just focusing on results from the anterior QL approach in the five cadaver studies. Out of the five cadaver studies, two of the cadaver studies showed spread to the paravertebral um, region. Probably the, the likelihood for the differences in the results is differences in methodology and differences at the, at the vertebral level of injection. For example, if you inject at the L1 level, you're more likely to get spread to the paravertebral space than you inject at the L4. The most consistent finding from these cadaver studies, and also it's consistent with the large number of case reports and, ran and a few randomised control trials, is that the nerves that are most likely to be involved with quadratus lumborum block are iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. So these are the structures up here, and it's not surprising that these nerves are consistently involved with QL because these nerves lie in the plane anterior to quadratus lumborum muscle. So this technique is very suitable, I think, for open procedures on the groin. If you're doing uh, major interventional work in the groin, if you've got a patient for an open hernia repair, I think this can be quite effective. In terms of the randomised controlled trials, there's a limited number of trials at this stage. Three of the studies, at least, are from patients having caesarean section, one paediatric study, and uh, one patient having uh, a arthroplasty for proximal femoral fracture. They all have the same result, and that's that they're all opioid sparing. They all reduce pain scores. Um, and it's really a matter of deciding whether the magnitude of opioid sparing is worth the effort of doing the block in your particular practice. This is an example from Dr. Blanco, who's, who invented this block and has really popularised this block. This is patients who are randomised to receive local anaesthetic or saline in a quadratus lumborum block for caesarean section, and you can see the results there. There was opioid sparing at six and 12 hours, but not beyond that period. If you look at the technique, um, my preference is to place the patient lateral and place the transducer just cephala to the iliac crest. And this is really a little bit idealized. I wouldn't normally use a linear transducer almost always for this block. I'd be using a low frequency curvilinear transducer because you need tissue penetration and it's critical to identify the structures that I've outlined there, including the vertebral body of the lumbar vertebra, the psoas major quadratus lumborum. It's particularly uh, important to locate the transverse process because the quadratus lumborum muscle is attached to the quadratus, um, the quadratus lumborum is attached to the transverse process and it's particularly important to note the interface between the peritoneum and the anterior border of the psoas, because if you don't, you could inject into that area and cause injury to the peritoneum or kidneys. So here's an example of a block, and just ignore the artefact on the left, and uh, it's sometimes challenging to identify the needle because it's a steep trajectory and it's not, perhaps, perhaps not my best work, but the, the tip of the transverse process is here, and you can see it coming down. Um, and um, you can hydrodissect along the way, if you like, to help with your needle um, imaging. And then when you inject between the, um, between the psoas major here and the quadratus lumborum, you see quite a nice uh, ellipse. This is very suitable for placement of a catheter. 
Here's an example where the initial inject date was 10 mils and then I've rotated the transducer longitudinally so you can, I, see, I can see spread running cephalid between the psoas major and the quadratus lumborum. What's the indications and clinical relevance of this block? Most of the case reports have been in abdominal surgery. The lower extremity patients are mostly patients having hip arthroplasty. And like I say, these are all case reports. There's a limited number of randomised control trials. Um, I have used it in patients having complex or revision hip surgery, and I've been pleasantly surprised about the sensory block that I've got over the hip and to mid-thigh and up to the umbilicus. I've been pleasantly surprised with the opioid sparing effect and the analgesic effect in patients who are opioid tolerant patients who are comp who've got complex chronic pain issues. But I would not recommend it. I would not use it routinely for a patient having elective hip arthroplasty. When wouldn't you use this block? I would treat this block as a deep block and I'd apply the same precautions as other deep blocks and as recommended by ASRA. So this means that you'd apply the same level of vigilance regarding perioperative coagulation as you would to an epidural catheter. Complications, these could be local anaesthetic related, again, related to dosage, or it could be direct spread to the lumbar plexus because we're very close to the lumbar plexus and motor block has been described following QLB. Of course, direct needle trauma could occur because the kidney is close by and, and this is a vascular area, bleeding could occur. So be, be very careful with this block if you choose to use it. We're going to move on to the thorax now. And maybe this is the sexy part of plain blocks. And interesting, the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia has been having a large number of articles, review articles, editorials on plain blocks and on regional anesthesia in general. This is unusual for me to see such a focus on regional anesthesia in this journal. And they declared that the... Um, they declared that thoracic analgesic techniques and, and the, the, the 2017 was the year of the interfascial plane block. So that's, that's interesting. So they're referring, of course, to erector spinae block and pectoralis blocks. Erector spinae block was described in 2016 for two patients who had severe thoracic neuropathic pain, which was unremitting and unresponsive to maximal therapy maximal pharmacological therapy and all the non-pharmacological therapies they could find. And they injected at a trigger point where the patient had the most pain, which happened to be three centimetres lateral to the spinous process of T5. And when they injected in the plane using ultrasound guidance between rhomboid and erector spinae, to their surprise, the patient had a dramatic and complete reduction in pain and quite a reasonably prolonged duration of pain relief. And to the surprise, there was extensive multidermal tomal sensory block involving both the posterior rami and the ventral rami. They did some MRI studies that showed extensive spread up and down the vertebral column. Initially, they injected superficial to the rectus spinae, but with a little bit of trial and error, they decided and realised that they were going to get a better result if they injected between the rectus spinae and the transverse processes. It's very convenient that the transverse processes in the thoracic region are directed posteriorly because this means it's more superficial and easier to identify using sonography. There's been a huge number of case reports since this time. And given that it does take a little while to publish a case report, the fact that there's such a large number of case reports published since 2016 is significant. Most of them use between 20 and 30 mils of local anaesthetic most use a concentration of ropivacaine around about 0.375 or 0.5 per cent or bupivacaine 0.25 per cent. Some add adjuncts such as adrenaline, which is what I'd, I'd recommend. And they've been used for a wide number of surgical types, including VATS, including a range of breast surgical techniques, uh, even shoulder uh, ish, patients with challenging shoulder pain issues. Uh, used for pneumothorax surgery and used a lot for rib fractures and we've used it a lot for rib fractures and clearly this is a lower risk procedure than performing a paravertebral block in that population and many of our patients who come in with rib fractures are elderly, they've been trimming their, their olive tree or something like that. Uh, we have a lot of Italians and Greeks in our area and they've fallen off the ladder and they're on um, oral anticoagulants and so they can't, you don't really want to do a paravertebral block 
but doing an erector spinae block is very much uh, something you can do in an anticoagulated patient, in my opinion. You can do this block sitting up, and it's quite easy to do sitting up, and the simplicity of that is you just can explain to the anaesthetic nurse, we're going to place the patient in the same position as if we were doing a thoracic epidural, and it's important that they're placed in a similar position with their back curved towards you, because by curving the patient in a similar position to a thoracic epidural, you're bringing the transverse processes more uh, superficial, more posterior. I recommend marking the midline, writing the correct side, marking, putting a line two and a half to three centimetres off the midline. Most people place the transducer longitudinally so you get a sagittal view of the structures and many of the descriptions involve a cephalid to caudal needle trajectory. But clearly you could do it in many ways. I think it's critical to scan from lateral to medial and note the change in the morphology as the ribs move anterior or deeper to be placed anterior to the transverse process at the costotransverse junction. And often you can see a double shadow at the costotransverse junction and that really helps you to get orientated. And the transverse process has quite a reliable and consistent morphology and usually you see a step up when you go from the ribs to the transverse process in sagittal plane. And doing the same thing real time, we're on the ribs, ribs. And in a moment, you'll see there's a change in morphology. There's a double shadow just now, and now we're on the transverse process. So I recommend that you do this dynamically and mark out the location of the transverse process very clearly. And this is a very simple technique. It can be done in plane. Most people recommend going down on the transverse process. And once you come close to the transverse process or touch it, it can be a little bit uncomfortable at that stage. Just be wary of that inject local anaesthetic, and usually you see the erector spinae muscle lift up quite nicely off the transverse processes, and it's quite a consistent sonographic endpoint. You can place a catheter here, and here we can see the local anaesthetic being injected through the catheter, so we're very clear, clear that the catheter's in the correct plane, and I recommend doing that. And the other thing you can do is um, inject caudal to the transverse process like this, and that's probably what I'd recommend, leaving the needle tip in the catheter just caudal to the transverse process, not sitting on the tip of the transverse process. Another thing I'd recommend here, now a larger patient, curvilinear transducer on the ribs, coming immediately, coming up to the transverse process now, continue to scan medially, and now we're on the lamina. Why is it important to locate the lamina? Well, being able to sequentially go through your examination from ribs to costotransverse junction to transverse process to lamina means you're very confident about where you are. So I recommend a systematic approach. And here's the lamina here, those white lines here. This is the region of the intervertebral foramina. And this is about five and a half centimetres deep. So it's not that unusual to have your target, the lamina, being that deep. I will come back to the lamina in a moment because one of the plane techniques in the thorax is the retro lamina block. Another thing I recommend is not just rely on one plane in the sagittal plane, but also go in the transverse plane and locate the same structures. So you're ro rotating the transducer 90 degrees and try and locate all of the structures in both planes so that you can be really confident about where you're injecting the local anaesthetic. So what is the mechanism of erector spinae block? Well, the original description cadaver study, there was two cadavers, I think, in that initial series in 2016, they said that there was dye in the vicinity of the origins of the ventral and dorsal rami of the spinal nerves. But they didn't say specifically that those rami were stained or heavily stained. So there's a little bit of controversy in my opinion. This is a study by, done by Dr. Yang, I think it's from Korea. And what they did here was they compared two techniques. They compared the erector spinae block technique, where we're injecting on the transverse process, to the retro lamina technique we're injecting posterior to the lamina in this cadaver study. And what they found was in the erector spinae group, there was large amount of lateral spread. In the retro lamina group, there was a large amount of axial spread. In both groups, there was deep staining of the back muscles, the intrinsic back muscles. There was some staining of the thoracic nerves. But the way they describe it is not completely convincing the deep staining was in reference to the back muscles, not the intercostal nerves. Recently, we did a cadaver study and we replicated the rectus spinae block. So we did this in specimens in the prone position, used a very similar um, technique to that described. 
we had 20 sides injected 20 mils of half percent methylene blue, which is consistent with other uh, studies. And we found some very consistent results, which I guess were disappointing in the context that only in one in the 20, one out of the 20 sides were the, was the proximal ventral rami or proximal dorsal rami or dorsal root ganglion stained by the dye. In the remaining 19 sides, the ventral rami were not stained by the dye. And you can see that up here where we put the white um, paper behind the ventral rami and they're not involved in the dye at all. And this is a very consistent result. There was no ambiguity with that. We can see in this picture here, we got involvement of the dorsal rami and the posterior rami and uh, or the proximal, um, inter prox proximal spinal nerve. And here more laterally, the intercostal nerves, again, next to the intercostal muscles, but not involved in dye. If you look at the muscle itself, it's not just one tube of muscle. It comprises the spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis muscles. The iliocostalis muscle is a massive muscle that extends laterally and attaches to the ribs. And this is the intermediate group of intrinsic back muscles. But anterior to that is the deep group of intrinsic muscles. And one of those muscles is the transversospinalis muscle. This is a really difficult area of the body to work anatomically because these muscles are heavily embedded into the bony structures. And it's very difficult to separate them and, and, and dissect away in this region. It's possible that the deep group of muscles is impairing anterior spread of local anaesthetic from the erector spinae plane to the paravertebral space. What was consistent as well was widespread lateral and cephalid and caudal spread of dye. So it was quite consistent and quite dramatic, particularly the both the lateral and the caudal cephalid spread. So we hypothesised that potentially one of the mechanisms of action is that the local anaesthetic can spread lateral enough to pick up the lateral cutaneous branches. So the attributes of this block is like the tap block. It's a relatively simple ultrasound guided technique. We're targeting, our, our target is remote from critical structures. So it's remote from the neuraxis, it's remote from the pleura. So when you go to get informed consent from a patient, it's a lot simpler. You can afford to do this block in slightly with, with perhaps a lower threshold, and as I mentioned before, in anticoagulated patients, I would be cautious, but it's not absolutely contraindicated. It can be done preemptively or as a rescue block, and it's been successful at the case report level in perioperative and also pain medicine indications. It probably has an important role in scenarios where you'd really like the patient to have something sophisticated, like an epidural technique, but you know that likely the patient would not receive it so an example is laparoscopic bariatric surgery. So it potentially has a role there. So we're going to move on. Erector spina block is one of the paravertebral variants. There's been several paravertebral variants. I also mentioned the retro lamina block. Um, Ioana Castacci from Ottawa described the midpoint transverse process to pleura block. And her perspective was that sometimes it's very difficult to accurately locate the space anterior to the superior costotransverse ligament. And it's a very steep trajectory using ultrasound. And sometimes it's very difficult to be confident that you're anterior to the superior costo transverse ligament. And her, her observation was that sometimes when the local anesthetic was injected posterior to the superior costo transverse ligament, there was still a sensory block that resulted from that. And she also hypothesized that many of the landmark techniques, the landmark techniques because we weren't ultrasound guided, we couldn't really be, they, no one could be really sure where the local anaesthetic was being injected, and much of, some of the local anaesthetic may not have been injected anterior to the, cost, to the costotransverse ligament. If you look at the simple geometry, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see that the, the needle's coming in at right angles, roughly, slightly upwards, and it's hitting the lower part of the transverse process. Now, if the operator walks off the transverse process, they're coming in at right angles to the skin. If the needle hits the upper portion of the transverse process and now the operator walks off the transverse process, they're coming in at a completely different level, a completely different angle. So therefore, advancing the needle one centimetre in both those scenarios will result in the needle tip being in completely different locations. So, um, and people, I've lost a slide here, but there's been a... Um, a editorial just in the journal Anesthesia, I recommend you read it, where they talk about this uh, concept of paravertebral by proxy, that, that some of our injections in this region were not truly in the paravertebral space. 
Is there any evidence for erector spinal block? Well, the studies are starting to come out, and this is in the, the cardiovascular journal, and this is a study of patients having um, cardiac surgery, single injection block, and uh, what they're documenting here is that patients who had a rectus spinal block were in blue, and their pain scores remained very low for several hours, and then started to catch up at about 12 hours. So there is some evidence now coming out at, in the uh, randomised control trials that perhaps erector spinal block may have an important role in thoracic regional analgesia. We've just started a pilot trial. It's a triple mast randomised placebo controlled trial looking at erector spinae block. And we're recruiting from St Vincent's Hospital and Waikato Hospital. It's a pilot trial. And the criteria for success of this trial is being able to recruit three uh, patients per week. And our goal is, you know, really, we're looking at the feasibility of setting up multi-centre trials involving regional anaesthesia in Australia and New Zealand in the same way that the Clinical Trials Network has done involving trials not involving regional anaesthesia. And we've so far kept up with our, our definition of success and we've recruited about 45 patients since May. So we're quite happy with our recruitment. Most of the patients are patients having VAT surgery. We're going to move on. Pectoralis plane blocks, again, another um, invention. Dr Blanco, who's very creative, but very smart, very skilled anaesthetist. He works in the United Arab Emirates. The mechanism and the underlying logic behind the pectoralis plane blocks is really robust. The important landmarks include the pectoralis major, which we know has a very large footprint on the chest wall, and the pectoralis minor, which is attached to the coracoid process in the second to fifth ribs, has a much smaller footprint. And these muscles are easy to identify using sonography in the same way that the Muscles for tap block are easy to identify. Located anterior to the pectoralis major is the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery, and this is, can, be, can be identified. And often immediately adjacent to the thoracoacromial artery is the, uh, the lateral pectoral nerve. So this is a lateral pectoral nerve here, and the medial pectoral nerve actually comes from beneath the pec minor. But the lateral pectoral nerve, which innervates both the muscles, has a close relationship to that artery, so that can be helpful. There's different ways of doing this block, and it wasn't actually definitively defined in its initial descriptions, but I recommend performing the PEX1 injection at the level of the third rib, and this is between PEC major and PEC minor, and the goal here is to block the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. Blockade of these nerves does, does not result in any cutaneous anaesthesia, or analgesia, but it will take out the pain related to the trauma to the muscles. So this may be particularly relevant and important for patients having breast implants. As I said before, the sonography is quite straightforward. You can see the pectoral branch there. You can see the uh, pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery, and, and that's likely to be the long thoracic nerve there. So that's quite handy. You get a nice ellipse, and I recommend injecting between 10 and 15 mils of concentration of local anaesthetic ranging between 0.2 to 0.5 per cent ropivacaine. The next injection, I recommend placing the transducer more caudal and more posterior. So in the mid-axillary line, if possible, or at least anticipate that your needle injection would be at the mid-axillary line. And now we're injecting between pectoralis minor and serratus anterior. And so we're moving the transducer caudal, and apologise for my photography, I've rotated it around, but in the lower foot um, picture, I'm really trying to demonstrate that the transducer is going more caudal and more posterior. And now I recommend doing this over the fourth rib or the fifth rib, and this is between pectoralis minor and serratus anterior. And this serratus anterior is quite a thin muscle, and you'll have to have the transducer angulated correctly to identify it, but it is easy to identify it overlying the ribs, and again, you get a nice ellipse. The goal of the second injection deep to pectoralis minor, is to pick up the lateral cutaneous nerves, which are really important, particularly T2, really important in breast surgery. And sometimes in a thin patient, you can actually see the gap, the gap in the slips between the serratus anterior, which is where those nerves come out. Now, when we inject deep to the pectoralis minor, we're now going from the thoracic region to the axillary region. We're now injecting deep to the clavipectoral fascia. So this second injection takes the local anaesthetic to a completely different region, and, and I think it's a very smart block. 
very briefly, when I first set up the block, I'll get this sonogram up here, which is similar to what you get for an infraclavicular block. And then I've just tilted the, I've gone slightly lateral to that. I've tilted the transducer medially to pick up the rib, the second rib, and then go further down the chest, pick up the fourth rib. And at about the fourth rib, you see the lateral margin of the pectoral minor. The pectoral minor has a very short, has a small footprint. And this is where I recommend injecting at the lateral border of the pectoral minor over the fourth or fifth rib between serratus anterior and <clears throat> serratus, between serratus anterior and pectoralis minor. If you go from distal to proximal, we're counting up the ribs from about the seventh rib, and then you just see again, we've got the lateral, the lateral board of the pectoralis minor coming in there. So you can do this dynamically to really orientate yourself and be sure where you're injecting. This block has been extensively used for breast surgery, um, including reconstructive surgery. It's been used a lot for minor surgery. I think it's indicated in axillary dissection, breast implants, it's been used for a large number of thoracic applications, including AICDs, left ventricular assist devices. It's also, it's also been used following, for your analgesia following ma um, median stenotomy. I just put up this randomised control trial just to highlight one of the strengths of the PEX block. And in this study, it was compared to a thoracic paravertebral block. And what was, what was different about the PEX block was that they had more consistent involvement of the intercostobrachial nerve. So you can see this was involved in 17 of 20 patients. So if you're selectively wanting to get a blockade involving the intercostobrachial nerve, that is the lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve, potentially the PEX2 injection may help. Here's a study published in August, I believe. This is PEX1 block, patients having unilateral breast surgery. This was a well-controlled, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. Patients also got very thorough multimodal analgesia and infiltration by the surgeon. The primary outcome was pain scores 30 minutes after arrival. And you can see from the box plots there was no difference in pain, no significant difference um, in this study. So they do not recommend using um, the PEX1 block for breast surgery. In this context, in their, in their practice, they um, did uh, comment that, that a lot of their patients having breast surgery, and it's the same in our practice, are having minor surgery, not major surgery such as mastectomy. This is another study published this published last year, larger study, again, well conducted, I think it's from um, Belgium, and it's double-blinded, placebo-controlled, and had multiple primary outcomes that were all pain-related, and that seems to be the theme of the plan blocks almost always the outcome, the primary outcome is pain related, not something <clears throat> more sort of long, long lasting, for example. But they're showing here that there was a significant opioid sparing effect with the uh, PEX2 block in this, in this study. Now there's another block uh, that I haven't mentioned and another structure that I haven't mentioned, and that's the anterior cutaneous branches of the, of the intercostal nerve. So the PEX2 block will pick up the lateral cutaneous nerves but it will not pick up the anterior cutaneous nerves. So the anterior cutaneous nerves innervate the sternum medially, and these can be um, anaesthetised in the sternal bed medially. And the muscle that's deep to this nerve is the transversus thoracic nerve uh, muscle, and the transverse thoracic muscle is equivalent to the transverse abdominis muscle in the abdomen. And uh, if you want to do this, then you need to do a separate block. So this is a study from Japan, and Dr. Yushima and Ataka from Tokyo have been prolific in case reports in plane blocks, but here they're focusing on, on the, here they've done a really nice randomised controlled trial. They compared PEX block alone with combined PEX and transversus thoracic plane block. If you want to do this technique, this is a little bit what the block will look like. And you're imaging very medially, identifying the neurovascular plane and you really are injecting very close to the pleura, as you'll see here. Now, whether you need to go to this extent as in depth, I'm not entirely sure. Now, in their study, not surprisingly, the addition of the transverse thoracic plane block to take out the anterior cutaneous branches resulted in improved analgesia in patients having mastectomy. Just going to move on to a study that we've just completed recruiting. It's a PEX block study, it's triple masked, randomised controlled trial comparing PEX block with surgical infiltration for breast surgery. All patients <clears throat> received either a PEX block 
or surgical infiltration, either with local anaesthetic or saline, and it was reversed, depending on what patients were groups that were randomised to. And I'd like to acknowledge Gloria Sia and Kelly Byrne, who've done a lot of work on this, and we've recruited from three hospitals, St Vincent's Hospital, Waikato, and Peter McCallum. The primary outcome was quality of recovery at 24 hours, and I've put up the quality of recovery score for those who are not familiar with it, but it comprises 15 questions that relates a lot to well-being and how patients are managing, not just physically but emotionally, following their surgery. It's been validated following a large number of surgeries. And some people are recommending these type of metrics as primary outcomes in randomised controlled trials. It has two um, questions on pain, one question on nausea and vomiting. The maximal score is 150. So you're feeling really good, you'll score 150. If you're having a bad day, you, you'll go down a little bit. Now, here what we've done, regardless of group allocation, you can see that the preoperative score was 134, mean standard deviation for 134, 14, and postoperatively was 125, 21. So <clears throat> that's what you'd expect. You'd expect the QR15 to drop from preoperative to postoperative because patients are recovering from their surgery. But if you look at the difference, <clears throat> preoperative minus postoperative, in some cases the score is negative. Now, why is that? Why would you expect a negative score? Well, probably not surprising. Some people are going to feel better after their surgery. They've just been diagnosed with breast, breast cancer the week before. They've come in for major surgery. They're stressed. They're anxious. Thank God, I've got that. God goodness, I've got that surgery out of the way. It wasn't so bad. So, a proportion of patients reported a negative score. If you now look at the group allocation, which we've only just unblinded, and this is the first look, you can see that there's no difference in the quality of recovery score between the two groups. Um, 134 versus 133, very similar distribution on the, on the dot plot. Um, this is a baseline. So in other words, a baseline, both groups had a si similar score for their preoperative um, rating of their quality of recovery. And then at 24 hours, postoperatively, again, there's no difference um, between the two groups. So that's the initial look at the data in this study. No difference in quality of recovery using pectoralis blocks for breast surgery. I'd like to comment that a lot of the surgery in this, in this series was 104 patients. A lot of it was minor surgery, um, breast uh, rest, wide local excision and sentinel node biopsy, for example. If you look at the difference of baseline to quality of recovery, looking at the data slightly differently, again, there's no difference between the groups. We're just approaching the minim minimally important clinical difference, which is eight in the, in the PEX active group. It's possible, we possibly have an issue with power, but I don't think it is likely to be the case. Another study looking at pectoralis blocks published this year, again, used quality of recovery of their primary outcome. This is in um, European Journal. They used the QR40, which is another of the quality of recovery scales, and I'm not gonna show you the results in any detail, but in this study, again, no difference in quality of recovery with pectoralis blocks for patients having breast cancer surgery. Just gonna finish up, just briefly mention the serratus plane block. When we inject between the serratus plane and the, and, the, and, the, and the pectoralis minor, we're really starting to inject into the, we're really starting to inject into the, um, into the serratus plane, but usually the serratus plane block is performed more, um, more, posterior, more caudally um, and we're injecting in the plane between latissimus dorsi and the serratus uh, anterior muscle. When we inject into this plane, we're likely to pick up the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves. <clears throat> this becomes a little bit more of a busy area compared to PEX1 and PEX2 potentially, because in this plane between serratus anterior and, or well, superficial to the serratus anterior, we've got the thoracodorsal nerve, we've got the thoracodorsal artery, thoracodorsal artery is initially known as a suprascapular artery and is the largest branch of the auxiliary artery. So this is a very vascular region, so just be note, mindful of that when you perform this block. Um, but there's, there's some reasonable number of case reports and, and other stuff, other information in the literature that would support the use of serratus plane blocks. So I'm gonna finish up there. Some of the key points that I've re referred to, either directly or indirectly, is that we really need to pay meticulous attention to indication anatomy, technique and equipment if we're going to deliver these, um, these, these blocks safely and efficaciously. The plain blocks across the spectrum of blocks and studies are opioid sparing. 
It's really a matter of you looking at the individual studies and deciding whether the magnitude of the opioid sparing effect is worthwhile or, or indicated in your practice. It's also noteworthy that very few, if any, of the randomised control trials have, been, have not been performed in the ERAS environment. And that's something that will become more evident as time goes on. They need to be performed in the ERAS environment because ERAS, with its superior multidisciplinary collaboration and multifaceted care, standardised care around the perioperative period is associated with good outcomes per se. There are multiple opioid sparing techniques other than local anaesthetic techniques, and I haven't talked about them in any detail, but drugs such as ketamine, alpha-2 agonists, we've mentioned the simple drugs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, paracetamol, all have a role, but there's other drugs that are opioid sparing, that, such as lidocaine infusion, and even esmolol infusions, which, which, which are, there's evidence for their opioid sparing effect. And it's really important that we use um, standardised oral multimodal therapy in, in all our patients if we think that they need a block, because eventually the block's going to wear off. I think it's fair to say the erector spinal block is early in its evolution, um, and we need to give it time to grow. It's still, still a baby. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barrington, for a fascinating talk uh, and, and uh, really the next wave of where things are going to be going in the world of regional anaesthesia. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, firstly, I just want anybody who's got a question directed to uh, Associate Professor Barrington, um, anybody, uh, and then we'll open up to the panel. Dr. McLeod, Gilberto, just down here, front left, thanks. Get your skates on there, fella. Um, uh, thank you, Michael, for a superb uh, review. That was really just wonderful, I thought. Uh, well done. Um, uh, the question I have relates to the quadratus laborum uh, blocks and uh, erector spinae. Do we suppose that these blocks are going to um, manage the deep somatic uh, visceral pain from intra-abdominal surgeries? So it's certainly implied by people who are really enthusiastic about this block that that particularly the quadratus lumborum block has some form of visceral analgesia by virtue of the spread of local anaesthetic to the paravertebral block, paravertebral region. So therefore, when that occurs, you're getting a somatic block and also a, a sympathetic block, which is, is desirable. And so potentially that's the case, but I'm not really aware that there's any clear evidence that that occurs consistently. And the cadaver studies, as I indicated, are, are inconsistent. With the erector spinae block, you know, um, it's, there's a large amount now of clinical um, reports that indicate involvement of the ventral rami. If the ventral rami are involved with an erector spinae block, then you would expect that there'll be a sympathetic block with that. And so you would expect there'll be a visceral component to the analgesia. So that would, that would be a really neat thing. So I'm hoping that the, that will be the case. But as I said, the erector spinae block is still, still a baby. Right. Ah, thank you. Uh, we've probably got time for just one more question for we'll call the session to a close, but the, the panel might stay up the front for a few minutes afterwards if anybody has any, any questions. Any other questions, uh, particularly from the floor? Uh, if not, I'll just direct one to uh, Dr. Goitazolo, actually just back on the IPAC block. Just one thing that I was considering was uh, any concerns from a surgical point of view in regards to infection with the IPAC block, uh, particularly if there's uh, errant or inadvertent periosteal contact or breach. Yeah, well, we haven't had any um, more than the usual. Um, uh, remember that we, uh, the area is very well prepped, you know, we have you have to be very careful with the sterilization of the area. So we prep quite a bit, um, but we have not had any problems. Uh, r remember that we are doing the injections and they are placing not only local anesthetic when they do the particular injections, but also they are placing uh, methylprednisolone, which is something very unheard, you know, 10 years ago when injecting local anesthetic and steroids in the incision with a foreign body, um, but it's being done and, and it's well, you know, spread right now and uh, the incidence of infection has not improved, they're not getting worse than, than the usual.
Great. Thanks very much. Uh, I think we're just officially out of time there now, so I'll just wrap it up by uh, once again thanking our speakers, Dr. Nareko Gotezillo and Associate Professor Michael Barrington for two fantastic presentations. So just make sure you don't leave any valuables behind. Um, they say can't recognise, take responsibility for anything that may be lost. Refreshments will be served in the exhibition area, halls F and G on the ground level. Uh, if you've indicated special dietary requirements, please make yourself known to the banquet staff. A reminder, the committee has organised a wine uh, wall made up of 150 different bottles of wine ranging from $20 to $60 and over. Head over to the ACE booth for the wine lucky dip. Um, we encourage you, encourage you to visit all the ex exhibition booths and take advantage of the passport scheme with fantastic prizes on offer. Uh, and finally, we encourage all delegates to visit the program surveys in the Congress app again. And thank you very much again, everybody, for your participation and attendance at this talk.